Finance. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the Financial Independence Podcast, the podcast where I get inside the brains of some of the best and brightest in personal finance to find out how they achieved financial independence. I can't believe it, but I am finally interviewing the person that introduced me to this whole idea of financial independence in the first place, and that is Jacob Lund Fisker from EarlyRetirementExtreme.com. And I came across Jacob way back in 2011. I was reading GetRichSlowly.org, which I've interviewed the writer behind that blog, J.D. Roth, on a previous episode of the podcast. So I was reading his site, and he did a review of a book called Early Retirement Extreme, and it just blew my mind. And that was when I realized that early financial independence was possible, and if you saved enough money, you could then live on it and not have to rely on work anymore. So I'd say that was probably the most influential article I've ever read in my life because it completely changed everything. And over the years, I've heard lots of stories from people about who introduced them to the idea of fire. And, you know, Mr. Money Mustache is a big one. And even this podcast has introduced some people to the concept, which is amazing to me. But Jacob and ERE is what did it for me. So it's an honor to be able to talk to the guy that changed my life in so many ways. So rather than ramble on here, I just want to dive into it. So Jacob, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Yes, yeah. So it's, this is a long time coming. So I started this podcast way back in, I think, May of 2012. And you were going to be my first guest because you were the entire reason I knew about this whole thing called financial independence in the first place. But I chickened out and I ended up asking... A guy named Mr. Money Mustache, who was also a software developer like myself. And thankfully, I didn't know how big he was at the time and how big he would go on to become. But um, but yeah, this is this is a huge treat to be able to talk to you after all these years and to thank you for the huge impact you've had on my life. Because I, I was trying to think about it before this call, and I can't think of anyone other than maybe my parents and my wife who have had a bigger impact on my financial life than you have. Um, And it was all from an article on Get Rich Slowly. And I think it was maybe when JD was reviewing Um, your book back in 2011. Yeah, I mean, I think there was one that's like, I recently did like a 10 year update on Get Rich Slowly as as well. But I think there are like only only two of them. But yeah, but yeah, I mean, like at, at that time, I was I was I was mostly sort of like fading out of uh, out of out of existence. Like right when you started, that's that's about uh, half a year after I more or less ended. So <laughs> yeah, and it was it at was crazy. Sufficient. You had just passed the torch to Mr. Money Mustache, and that's why yeah. I was like, oh, I could I could talk to him because he's a software developer. That would be fun. And yeah, it was just around that time. And maybe that's where we can kick off because I'm interested to to hear what you've been up to. So you had you had written the book and it's a fantastic book. I've read it at least three times and you finished up what you had were trying to say with uh, the website and you were moving on and you passed the torch to MMM. And I believe at the time you were right. becoming a quant trader. Is that right? Yeah, something. I, we were never quite sure what my, my, my title was actually supposed to be, but I was mainly staring at financial bit. Financial data at a, at a giant screen setup and trying to see some patterns there. What was that experience like, um, and how how long did you end up doing it for? Uh, I was I was there for three three and a half years until 2015. Essentially, my experience there. I mean, when I was sort of like a young physicist, so to speak, I was very dismissal dismissing uh, of of anything finance and business. But uh, as I sort of like matured a little bit more and uh, <laughs> got into sort of like the postdoc area era era of, of my life i began to uh, sort of uh, kind, kind of came coincidental with the whole uh, financial independence thing i started reading into finance and economics and actually thought that uh, working in in the business in wall street could be could be really fun and uh, but that was that, that unfortunately happened sort of like around 2007 2008 uh, and uh, then the giant, uh, the, the great credit crisis essentially happened, and there was like tons of layoffs, and all hiring essentially froze. And then I thought, well, okay, that's kind of like it for me. I'm just gonna forget about that. Um, and so I basically did that. And then uh, I was sort of writing on the blog uh, instead, and I was always making these kind of comments about like uh, if only there had been more like a uh, 
physicists on Wall Street, then maybe this wouldn't have happened. You know, was like total. You now your standards are like physicist arrogance. We can fix everything. <laughs> and then uh, one of one of my readers actually uh, commented back on that post that if I'm still interested, maybe he could make that happen. And so I was like, yes, okay, let's try this, right? Because I mean, part of your readers sort of to. Uh, my my sort of philosophy is 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 to try as many different things as as you possibly can. So sort of, essentially, sort of like self actualize to the fullest by 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 doing many different things and learning many different things. So uh, he essentially got me into a uh, in a company in Chicago. So we left California in 2012, end of 11. So basically, just before you started podcasting. Uh, so. Uh, and same time, I sort of took that as an opportunity to uh, to stop blogging because I already felt that I but said everything there was to say on the blog. I finished the book, which was sort of like the uh, canonical textbook of both Fire and also sort of like the extended ERE part of it. I mean, to me, Fire is just sort of like a small aspect of what, of what what I was sort of like going on about. So, uh, so I did that for a few years. Yeah, I think the greatest takeaway of sort of I wouldn't maybe shock or surprise. Surprise is probably the better word. Is how big a difference there was between uh, like the, the academic side, the sort of like the internet armchair expert, and then the actual like practitioners. Because in in other fields like like science and engineering, you're sort of like used to uh, to having sort of like one line of insight, sort of that like goes from like not knowing anything to having maybe being like a hobbyist to being like a serious amateur and then you have people working in the business and then at the very top you have like professors who understand everything, right? That, but you would agree on that. That's typically how it goes. I don't, I don't know if it goes that way in like computing these days, but that's how it, how it would go in like, for example, physics. Whereas in, um, in finance or high finance or like Wall Street stuff, Wall Street does not mean the physical location. Essentially, means everything that has to do with trading and making deals that are outside the retail level. It has essentially fought. So there are like two different communities that almost have like a wall between them. So you have, uh, you have the, the academic side of it and then you have the, the the practical side and what's weird here is that like the practical side the practitioner side is is way bigger uh, way more well financed and in a sense more advanced whereas the um the academic side they have whatever I hope I'm, I'm probably insulting a lot of people now but they have essentially access to worse data because data is expensive i mean so it will be something like end of day closing prices you can get a subscription to that on, on the actual practitioner side you'll have everything tick by tick from multiple different exchanges and there's not just the market in the u.s i mean when i when i quit in 15 there were like 40 different i think exchanges and dark pools just in the u.s so way more data and that sort of like leads to sort of like different interpretations and different behaviors in those separate groups i mean yeah so that was my biggest surprise my biggest insight from it was probably how agnostic or how neutral people were in, in the in practitioners are in terms of like what's the best strategy. It's, it's more sort of like, well, I mean, this, this, is, this strategy might be good for this and this might be good for that. But overall, we'll sort of like look at what works and then just go with that. It's not like, uh, say, theoretical academic level where it's, where it's all an improvement and stuff we already know and Nobel Prize winners have shown that. And therefore, everything must cite back to something, some previous work. Mm -hmm or sort of like the more uh, dogmatic. So, I mean, that is, and I think that sort of like neutral sort of attitude spilled over into the rest of my life. So these days I'm sort of far less to uh, sort of like fly off a tangent because someone is wrong on the internet. So, so I think that is sort of like the biggest life lesson in that. That's a great takeaway. And did, did it affect how you view your own personal investments at all? I know back in the day when I was reading you, you were one of the people that wasn't on board with the whole buy and hold index investing, just set it and forget it sort of thing, which I want to dive into a little bit more. Right. Um, but first, did did your time in the industry on that practitioner side of Wall Street, did that influence how you invested as an individual or a family not really uh 
I mean, first first of all, it's like what what I was was doing was like completely different than what what I can do as a as a retail investor. So no, there's not really been any change. I will actually say I'm probably better as a retail investor than I than I was as a as a, as a professional. Uh, I uh, tend to be more risk adverse than this. Um, it's optimal for the industry, let's put it that way. <laughs> it's like one of the fun things, but every, everybody I work with absolutely enjoyed playing poker. And I hate poker. I don't know. <laughs> so, 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 I mean, that was interesting. Um, I think uh, in terms of like the whole sort of like the index investing thing, uh, it, I think the uh, my reputation has been somewhat exaggerated in the FIRE movement. I mean, I wrote a few posts back then where I, Asked some questions about the systemic effects that uh, sort of like a mass adoption of index investing could have on the markets as such, and that sort of eventually turned into like uh, this streak of guy just hates index investing. I think my bigger concern was the uh, the whole fire and forget attitude, or the let's let let's just hand everything over to an app or let's, you know, you want, you want something quick and easy, something simple. So just do that and then you can forget about it. I'd be interested to hear, to hear what you think of, you know, what happened, like uh, the fire movement, especially, you know, I think maybe 2017, 2018 just seemed like it was going crazy. What was it? What was it like? What were your thoughts on it at that stage? Cause this is, you know, seven years after you felt like you've pretty much said everything you wanted to say about it. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like 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 uh, doing the podcast here today. It's like, well, man, I did like uh, ten years ago. I've forgotten all about it, right? Now I need to, I need to revisit my notes, essentially. Yeah, I mean, it definitely hit the mainstream at that at that point. And uh, I mean, you start getting contacted by by various journalists because I mean, I'm sort of still known as one of the progenitors of it, and so of course they want my opinion on it. Um, and I think what what happened essentially. It's, so, so you get you get like a different kind of different kind of exposure. I mean, if you started, if, if you go like way back, not way back, but if you go back to sort of like this, the present iteration, which I think kind of started with me, uh, we were only like uh, at least I was sort of like the loudest, loud mouth of the bunch back then when we were like four or five people, right? Uh, I mean, I, re- I remember sort of, I mean, I'm, back back then, fire was not a thing. The whole financial independence was not a thing in the personal finance world. I mean, uh, when I was starting up, I was like, you, you know, you have these like blogger awards, blogging awards, and I was I was getting them for, for something like best in senior living, right? It's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> or like best entrepreneurial blogs. Like, I hadn't started any business, but that was sort of like the sort of the, um, the, 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 framework of sort of like the mid late 2000s that 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 financial independence could 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 fit into and so i started out at this like very extreme kind of thing so like way out of the left field doing crazy stunts you know like let's try not buying anything for a year so that was like completely unusual to do that back then and this this has now become sort of like a buy nothing year uh, you know, uh, uh, consumer diets. So now it's like an actual challenge, an actual thing that people go through. Uh, the idea of um, so 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 the whole retirement idea back then was the David Bach thing, where the the, the latte effect, where if you just save like two dollars a day or something, you would become a millionaire in like a like a hundred years or whatever. And the idea of retiring was that. You would save up a million dollars. It was always like a million dollars. So, so that year was to become a millionaire. Uh, investing, I think, like the four percent rule, that, that was a thing, uh, but it wasn't really that wide, widespread. It was, it was, it was. I mean, it was. It came out of the Trinity study, but back then the Trinity study was only like ten years old or something. So it was not. It was not uh, the foundation of anything. Uh, the way to sort of invest for retirement was more like um, I want to retire on this day or become uh, sort of like stop working, retire, whatever. Uh, and I have, say, uh, 700000 and I want to spend 40000 a year. And then they would go that way around and then compute. Well, then you need like a return of investment of, I don't know, it's about 6%, right? And so, given those six percent, what should your like uh, asset allocation or investment be like? So that was that was, that was sort of like pre four percent rule as a as a as a rule of thumb, and a lot of people 
retired and, and invested accordingly, right? Um, that kind of goes back to that warning about not uh, adopting a sort of like a ingraining sort of like a very simple, uh, simple understanding of how to invest for the next 60 years because some of these guys, you know, like that who retired in the in the 90s and with sort of that mental model, they sort of crashed and burned because investing in some something aggressive at 8%, which was perfectly possible in the 90s, did not work very well in the, between, say, 2000 and 2010. So would, yeah, you, I mean, would you be willing to share like sort of what your thinking is as far as personal investment now? And like, you don't have to obviously share any numbers or any actual strategies, but maybe just give a sort of an idea of like what you're thinking as far as how you invest your own FI portfolio. No, I mean, I think, I mean, I mean, having, having invested uh, for, for almost 20 years now, I can definitely say that it, it, it changes. I mean, it, it changes you, you change, I mean, I change my investment depending on whether I make money or I don't make money. Uh, I, it depends on how big the network has become. I mean, if you are like starting in the beginning, then index funds, for example, makes like great sense because you're not, you don't have to think very much, think very hard about them. You can concentrate on your salary instead. I mean, and, and then sort of like a, way, a great way to identify that demographic is when they plot, you know, you, you, you plot your network. A graphic and it's just a straight line up, right? Because of you know your dollar cost averaging is completely and utterly dominating the, the the sort of market impact of whatever your net worth is. Like maybe your um, you you probably have sort of like less than ten to fifteen annual spendings. So that's essentially how we calculate net worth these days. Like how many years of spending have you saved? So, so if you're below 50, then your net, then your network curves tend always tend to be a straight line because it's it's dominated by salary. But then once you sort of get into get into the 25 plus, and if you get even higher, I mean, the, my problem is essentially I spend so little that whenever people pay me money, I don't know what to use it for. So it just like just keeps going going up and up and up. I, I mean, right now it's like at 130, uh, and from that perspective, you know, like volatility or risk risk for me is no longer volatility risk for me is a permanent loss right maybe that's another sort of like practitioner takeaway these these guys don't care about volatility they care about money that never comes back right uh, because volatility is only really relevant if you're like uh, if you're doing research then volatility is sort of like a sort of like a very easy way to define risk because you can calculate, you know, it's a standard deviation essentially. And it's, it's useful if you're, a, if you're a bank and you're sitting in the middle between a customer and a big pool of money because how much it sort of like rips between the effects, whether you have like uh, slippage losses. But for sort of like for practical people, it's, it's the risk of permanent loss. So my personal strategy is tended towards becoming like a lot safer, you know, like belt and suspender kind of stuff. Uh, my interest in investing, investing is also kind of going down. So I actually might end up just like putting everything into a global fund or something. The thing I worry most about are the cases where um, someone comes in and, and says, uh, I don't care anything about investing or finance or anything. Uh, I just want sort of like a, a sort of like a one-stop solution for, for my post-fire life. And I, th I think that is ex that, that I don't know what what to call that risk. It's sort of like an, an uh, like an ignorant uh, paradigm risk, ignorance risk. Um, because I mean paradigms change. I mean they change every ten years. I mean if if you only go have to go back ten years and look at the real estate bubble. And, and see how that was sort of like in many ways in the U.S., not in Canada, where it didn't pop. But here, it was in many ways driven by, by, by sort of the same dogmatic slogan-based understanding that you s tend to see in, in sort of like, I, I wouldn't say it's like the entire fire movement, but there are many, many in the, in, in, in the fire movement that have, have sort of like the same thing, like, well, I'm not making any more land. Or you just buy the biggest house you can. And because they'll, you know, you'll never get this chance again. Or they're not making any more of it. Uh, just paint the walls, essentially. Um, and, and and you can you can go back and see 
these kind of ideas like fail over and over and over again because people didn't change their mind. They didn't pay. Well, they, I think it, it, it's just like a twofold. I mean, you can, you, can, you, can, you can sort of fail in two ways. You can have the paradigm shift under you and then essentially like miss the train. Or worse, you can keep insisting that, that that one strategy you learned when you were like 25 is still valid and, you know, like when you're 50, right? Uh, because if, if you go back, I mean, I made a list and see if I can find it. Yeah, so like, so the dominant paradigms have essentially been index investing since the 2010s is sort of like when that exploded. And part of the reason it exploded was, of course, because interest rates were both dropped, and then you had all these quantitative easing things, uh, plans both both in the U.S. and in Europe, and you could actually plot the, like the stock market index with bands. When when you have quantitative easing, the market goes up. When the easing stops, it goes flat. Then it starts again, goes up again. You know that's not that's that's not really a booming economy. That's like a, a an economy on like heroin or something. I mean that's just bad. And, and you can't keep doing that forever, but I mean, so far so good, right? And if you uh, if you sort of um, if you said like this is which actually happened in, in sort of like the practical world and, and on Wall Street, I mean, I, I knew a bunch of like value investors. That's not what I was doing, but people doing value investing, and they were sort of like just getting depressed because everything was like completely overvalued. There was like nothing to buy that made sense, right? So they're just sitting on piles of cash waiting and waiting and waiting, you know, and if you've been waiting for 10 years, right? Mm -hmm. uh, then the question, you can't you can keep insisting that, that you are right and the market is wrong. I mean, you can only do that so far, right? So I mean, that's a, that's, that's a tricky part there. But like going back, so you had like real estate in the 2000s, and a little bit again after it recovered, people got into it again. You know, with the, now they call it house hacking. It's always a new new word. Um, you had dot coms in the in the in the nineties, uh, but obviously not anymore, right? Although a bit again now. Right? There's still, I mean, five biggest companies uh, in the S and P five hundred. That's twenty percent of the index, right? They're called the giant five. So, like uh, Facebook, Microsoft, Apple. Google and I probably forgot one, and they're like forty percent of the Nasdaq in the index. How how's that for diversification? <laughs> anyway, going back again, right? So in, in the eighties it was commodities and then uh, CDs uh, like bank CDs because the interest rates were so high, you can't get anything out of that anymore. So like a safe CD investment from from the eighties would have completely bombed, right? Seventies gold. Uh, my uncle collected stamps, you know, so it, was, it was essentially because the market was flatlined and bonds were not doing anything. So people were just buying collectibles, thinking that that would sort of be the thing. In the 60s, it was like blue chips. You know, you're just going to buy the big companies and then you'll be safe forever. And as a result of that, the, the multiple expansion was immense. So similar to what you see today in internet stocks, you know, you had like P ratios about 50. So like it will take decades for these people to actually like return a decent amount of sort of like economic profit as opposed to just like greater fool profit of people like buying slightly higher and so on. So, I mean, the thing is, though, um, I think people can get, I mean, the, the biggest mistake one can make is to believe that you, under, you, you know everything there is to know about investing. That's sort of like you have this kind of like dogmatic mind. Uh, I'm not going to like super insist that everybody become an expert on this, but I, I do think uh, that I think the least people can do or should do is sort of like pay attention from time to time. It's like is index investing still a thing? And if it is cool, just keep doing that. But if 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 everybody around you have sort of like moved on to something else, whatever that is, maybe it's sort of like time to start questioning whether you are sort of like still the genius you think you are, right? I think that's great advice. And it seems like right now yeah. is potentially a paradigm shifting event, COVID and then all the money being pumped into the economy. What are your thoughts on that? Have you, have you spent any time thinking about what this means for the next decade and what's going to be the big thing for that? Because it does seem like this is a, a turning point potentially in how people think of investments and what the government's ability to get involved is. 
Uh, well, investment-wise, I haven't really done much change. I mean, I was already like a belt and suspender. I mean, it was kind of shocking to see things did that fast, right? Uh, that was crazy fast compared to, say, 2008. 2008 was sort of more like a, a slow grind. You know, I lost 1% today. Tomorrow I lost another percent, you know. And after 30 days, you know, you're just sort of getting punished every every day until you're sick of it. And then when when sort of like the maximum number of people got were, were sufficiently sick, it flipped because there were no more were, were willing to sell it and it went up again. Here it was more like slam, slam, and then suddenly we up again. I mean, it was it was crazy volatile. Uh, so, I mean, there was like a lot of people in the futures market that just had like a field day with that. Uh, so for them, it was good. But for, for sort of like buying bonus, it, was, it must have been very interesting. Um, but of course, here the government like stepped in and like immediately practically guaranteed all the corporate bonds, right? So they were dropping like, I mean, they should. Uh, so you have like AAA rated bonds that should normally be almost like treasuries losing, I don't know, 20, 30 percent like over a week. I mean, that's insane. And then they gain it just as fast. As, as the government comes in and backstops the whole thing. From, uh, I actually have sort of like more interesting to uh, report on COVID from the ERE perspective, because um, so, so ERE was originally not intended to be some, to be a, like a fire thing. So, so from my perspective, it was, it was, it was certainly more intended to, to be, be sort of like a resilient lifestyle, like a low resource intensive lifestyle for, for essentially um, in, and, and sort of like if we if we were to run into like a limits to growth environment, could we still could would it still be possible to live live well? And so for me, it has always been about uh, like high highly efficient living and how to make it resilient and not become financially independent as much as becoming like economically dependent, like independent of the econ- economy. And so that essentially is like year at the high at, at, at a high level. And if you do that, then fire just becomes a nice side effect. You know, if you have a job, people pay you money, but you don't have anything to use it for, so you just park it in a savings account, which is actually what I did myself for like the first five years until I found out there was something called investing and the crazy idea of like using money to make more money. I mean, that was just bizarre to me. I mean, I'm, I'm an immigrant, so like I, I'm from Denmark where like stock investing was not a thing. It, it really wasn't. I mean, Savings, they would put them in bricks, you know, in the housing. But owning stocks and bonds, that was just weird. So, so with COVID, you know, being independent of the economy already, there was like practically no change in my the way we live here. And on on the farm, we had sort of like a slight tension between um, what you would call like the traditional fire people, sort of like high high incomes, uh, but and and total belief in like comparative advantage, you know, so it's kind of like the, um, I'm not going to spend my time doing a, like fixing a flat on my bicycle for, for $15 when I'm making like $50 a, an hour. So you see that, you see that attitude a lot, especially the higher, the more people earn, the less they're willing to like deal with like the little things. Um, and they suddenly realize, well, I mean, it doesn't really matter that I have all this money if, if but, you know, like everything is on lockdown and I can't do anything. Whereas for sort of like the resilient system I built up and, and some of the other guys that, that, that built up instead, it was like, wow, this is what we've been prepare, preparing for practically. And, and so there was actually a lot of shifts in sort of like the one dimensional money only consumer producer kind of thing towards the sort of like more systems theoretical way of integrating integrating your production and your consumption in your personal life so you're no longer just having having money come in from this side and then you so you earn it here and then you buy stuff here to solve your problem it's like more of a the, the, the total solution and, and that, that's one of my favorite parts of the actual book. And it, it, ERE is one of my favorite finance books. And it's not even really a finance book, as you said. It's more a philosophy book yeah. about overall life strategy and systems. And yeah, the, the financial independence part is a byproduct of that life. Yeah. And um, But it's the, it's the systems approach to lifestyle, lifestyle design that I really enjoyed. And I still think about it a lot. Like when uh, Mr. Money Mustache bought that... Uh, 
piece of property on Main Street and had this like community thing. I was like, that's that's a such an amazing idea because I'm an introverted guy, but I do enjoy meeting people in my community and socializing. And I was like, that's a great idea. Now he he has this place that just sort of like promotes that. And at the time, somebody was talking about maybe like starting a brewery. And I was like, oh, that that would be ideal because it's, you know, you get the forced socialization, you're building something, you're building a business, which is always fun and challenging. But on the health side of things, which in your book, you talk about like how these second order effects of some decisions and how it could be negative, positive and for something like a brewery, it'd be great for the community, the socialization, the challenge, the creation, um, creativity, things like that. But it'd be terrible for the health side of things because I would find myself <laughs> drinking more yeah, beer. Yeah. So it, it's definitely something that I've kept in mind over the years and it really does help me make decisions. And it's like, okay, yeah, this is this seems good up f- at first, but what's the knock-on effect going to be? So yeah, yeah, yeah. I was wondering if you could maybe talk about how you've used the thinking and designed your life and how that has made you really resilient uh, for a pandemic. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so like uh, I almost feel like sort of like uh, describing the whole thing now. So like the book is very much about like contrasting and comparing what, uh, what uh, we grow up with taking for granted, which is essentially the idea that, uh, that you specialize in a job, you get an education, you specialize in a job and that, gives you earning power and then you uh, you essentially measure how successful you are in terms of how high your earning power is. I mean, in, in the English language, we even have like expressions like, how, what, what, how much are you worth? I mean, and when, when we ask that question, we want to know, like, you know, like it's a money question practically. It's, it's, it's not like how nice a person are you or what do you do for your community? Are you like good in an emergency? I mean, it's really like... Are you making lots of money? And along the same dimension, it, it's uh, happiness is often equal spending. And I mean, I don't know if I'm like uh, projecting too much, but you can see how how fire kind of de- developed into like lean fire and, and fat fire. And how, I, I mean, I've, I'm obviously <laughs> somewhat even more extreme than lean fire, but fat fire is often sort of accuses us on the other side of like living a life without happiness because we are like sacrificing so much because spending is happiness. So, I mean, I mean, it's not surprising. I mean, from even like from, from your like 10 years old or six, from the time you're old enough to watch ads, right? I don't know when that, when that happens, like age three or something. You do get sort of like com- totally and, and continually reinforced that, that if you buy something that increases your happiness, you know, you get a shot of dopamine. Or if you have a problem, you, you pay someone. Uh, so all you need to do is like learn and then you buy and then you're going to buy. You have this kind of cycle. Um, personal finance, when, when I started with it, sort of tried to step out a little bit of that. And I mean, if, if you're sort of into the spending equals happiness and you just do your job, then it's no, no surprise that like half of Americans end up not having more than $400 for, for an emergency, right? Which is tragic, crazy. I mean, it's, <laughs> it shouldn't be that way, right? Uh, so, so like initial personal finance that, that then becomes about like prioritizing your spending and not just like blowing your money left and right and then trying to keep everything together with credit cards and people start learning how to budget you know that's a basic skill um i don't know if they teach this in schools today they didn't when i was young so to to a large degree people are not taught sort of like the fundamentals of the society they live in it's kind of like fish swimming in water right i mean they 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 do not discuss the water ever So, so to them the water does not exist and and to to a similar degree, you know the the whole idea of earning and buying as a lifestyle is not something people see from the outside. It's something they they can't see because they're inside of it, right? So if if people so so on the blogging world, it's almost some, some it's almost like getting an education when you get into this from from sort of being blind to the water and then getting up. So you learn to budget and prioritize, and then if you're a little bit more advanced, you start optimizing your budget so you know, like where's my money spent best you know like when how do i get the bed how, how do i get get the best deal out of this but it's still sort of things are looked at in isolations like uh, what is the best car here you know like uh, does this car make me happy you know like where do i get the maximum return on of my money in terms of like my choice of driving whether how do i like make the best food 
So it's all sort of like seen as individual things to 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 optimize. You want to spend money well, so you have all these like consumer reports and reviews. So and the the the, the underpinning of all this is of course specialization and comparative advantage. People are distinctly sort of like pushed back towards like you just got to earn more money because this is you're wasting your time if you try to learn other things. Uh, and sometimes you kind of I mean you kind of expect guess uh, you kind of suspect that half the economy is just in the in, in the business of like creating problems for the other half of the economy to solve, right? I mean, it's kind of like with the brewery, right? So, so you, you 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 drink beer to become happy, but then you also become unhealthy, and then you have to take some other drug that uh, you know makes you healthy again. But that drug has side effects, so now you have to take a drug to remove those side effects and perhaps pay someone to administrate that whole business. So that's and this is this is kind of where where the where the the ERE book or where that philosophy comes in, because first of all, it kind of describes this screwed up system we're living in as, as it really is. So it kind of like takes the fish out of the water. So you look fish, you're like swimming in this pool of, of water here. In order to get out of that system, so, so this is kind of like where the meat is, this is my short summary of the book. So I introduced like the concept of like the Renaissance man, a Renaissance person, uh, which was sort of like um, an early ideal of the Enlightenment. Uh, it's kind of the, the, the original idea. So, 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 so today is more like a generalist on polymath. I think would be the right word. But essentially, the idea that humans have potentials have had potential to become many different things, and you should strive to develop in that way. Uh, you can kind of contrast it with today, where any kind of education development practically stops after college. And, but you should also like develop in many many other other directions. Like you should be healthy. You should uh, be able to sing. I can't sing. Uh, you should be able to like defend yourself with a sword, you know, or dance or whatever. Play play an instrument. Create art. All kinds of things. So essentially, the, the Renaissance idea was that you, that a person should be skilled in many things, which is like completely different than the industrial idea that you should be like skilled very skilled but in only one thing so once you're skilled in many things right then that essentially implies that now you can start doing many things you can do different things instead of paying someone else to do them for you and now you got to look at well then that's kind of what you described with uh, with the mmm's uh, main street operation or the brewery Everything you do has some outcomes. It has more, and it always has more than one outcome. There's always, always a side effect some, somewhere. And you've got to sort of ask, is that like a productive thing, a good thing, or a bad thing? And I, 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 I refer to those as, as goals. So like, for instance, like uh, if you have a brewery and, and, and you make beer and you drink beer, then that has the goal of like uh, making you happy or drunk or whatever. But it also has the goal of, of, of making you unhealthy. So goal does not imply some deliberate uh, thing. It does not imply anything positive either. It's simply an outcome. And so the system theory comes in when you start connecting these goals. So instead of just optimizing single points, like which is the best electric car, you begin to consider, well, which side effects does this have? Are there side effects to the side effects? And do I do something that's productive, but also counterproductive? And so uh, everything is then arranged, and in, in it's almost kind of like um, so. A, sy a system is essentially like a, a network. That's probably the best way to to describe that. So in a network, you have like nodes and connections, or you have like computers and cables between them. So it's it's like a network. And systems thinking essentially means looking beyond beyond the given node or the given action and see what impact does this have on the system itself. And so systems, it's not no longer just money flowing around like it would be on sort of like the one-dimensional linear earn, spend, earn, spend thing. It's, it's also like uh, happiness, health, meaning, skills. And from that perspective, then two things here. So I call it the web of goals, essentially. Uh, but could also call it a net of goals. The reason I call it a web is that if you look at it almost like a, a fisherman's net or web, you know, like for, catch, <laughs> for catching something. Or a, no, a spider web is probably a better example. Uh, if it breaks in some part, you know, like you fail to you fail to reach a goal, like saying back when 
I was trying to become like a quant in 2007. And I was, I was reading all, all, all these like high finance, like complicated finance, how to, how to price options and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but I failed at doing that. So that goal was essentially eliminated. But because it was aligned up with other productive goals, it, mean, it meant that I could still use that knowledge to invest for myself, mm. not like, you know, do, do harm to my own financial well-being. So, so in that sense, the web of goals is extremely resilient. I mean, you can you can cut parts out of it, and it still works. Whereas, if if you're sort of like a specialist who consumes, if you lose your ability to consume, then suddenly you have nothing, right? right. That was that was like the COVID experience, right? Oh my God! Suddenly, I have to learn how to cook my own food because I can no longer go out seven days a week. I mean, that happened to a lot of people, right? I mean, there are people who eat out. Every single day, they literally cannot fry an egg. I mean, I'm not exaggerating here. <laughs> and the other thing, so the other completely different perspective in, in, in the book is, of course, going back to the idea where like spending equals happiness, right? To me, spending money is, is bad in a sense because that implies that I have a poorly designed system. For me, spending money is, is resolving friction in the system. It's because something is not moving naturally. Right? It's a poor design. It's not well thought out. So, I mean, I'm not impressed when people say, well, I spend $100,000 a year. It's like, wow, man, you must have a lot of failures in your life since you need all that money. I mean, and that's essentially the book in, in a nutshell. And then there's like maybe 20 pages on, oh, yeah, and by the way, here's the math in case you want to declare financial independence. And that's, that's mainly in there because I got a lot of pushback in this whole, in this whole like, you can't become a financial independent in five years if you don't have a million dollars. That was sort of like the prevalent thinking like 10 years ago. So, so to go back to the system, the web of goals and the systems you have in place, like your systems must have been so dialed in even back in 2011, just because of the amount that you guys were able to spend per year means that, yeah, just like you said, you had removed all the inefficiencies and were able to really just not spend that much. Um, cause I think back in the day, I think it was, you were in San Francisco, which is, you know, thought of as a very expensive city. And yet you guys were only spending yeah. something like 7,000 a year. Um, so my two yeah. questions I'd like yeah. to talk about are, has, have you felt like your system has improved even since then? And I'm sure it's a constant thing that you're working on and adjusting. And two, has your spending increased at all over the years or has it actually decreased since 2011? Uh, it has it has changed in the sense that uh, so like even compared to like a normal consumer, our budget looks completely different. And, uh, like we spend like 60% of, of our money on what I would call head tax, uh, which is like unavoidable stuff like real estate, uh, health insurance. We cannot, you know, you cannot eliminate it. So uh, if if uh, if we move like west of Mississippi where real estate taxes are a lot lower, we would be spending even less than 7000 uh, per person. So like two adults, 14000 let's be clear. Um, so... I personally have been spending uh, around or less than, I mean, the problem also when you go back to 25 years and infl inflation becomes a factor, right? If I spend like 6,000 and 2,000, right? That would not be like spending 6,000 sure. today. So we're getting, I'm getting old enough where this seems <laughs> to become a factor. But, but sort of on an absolute level, uh, yeah, about 7,000. That was like uh, about a year when we just moved to, we were not in San Francisco, we were on the, on the other side of the bay, we were in the East Bay. Uh, but we had to rent the house there until we got, uh, got the RV, and that, was, that, was, that exceeded 7,000. But otherwise, since I moved away from home, it's always been about that low. So I've essentially kept my, my student stipend budget uh, ever since then, which is, which is a lot easier than if you sort of got, got used to living at, you know, like for 50,000 a year, 100,000 a year, then going the other way is a lot harder than not going up in the first place. Um, what has changed is, of course, the system. So the web, web of goals that I had have changed as well. I mean, we've tried many different ways to live on 7,000 at, at this point. I mean, so, so what, what does life look like since you uh, stopped working as a quant? What it would have been some of the things that you've been interested in learning? Like you mentioned the Renaissance man idea where you're constantly learning new things and developing yeah. new skills. What's been keeping you busy since the quant days finished? 
Yeah, so I mean, we bought a fixer, fixer of a sort of like a light fixer of a, so I mean, that's another thing where like people come out sort of, of they sort of like growing up with like a wide assortment of skills in terms of what they can do. Can they like take down drywall or something and put it up again? And in my case, I came in with absolutely nothing. I mean, I can just about like uh, drill a hole in the wall and hang something up that's level. That's sort of like the, <laughs> that's, 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 that's my childhood. Uh, education. So there was like a lot of figuring this this stuff out. I mean, I I renovated uh, our bathroom, uh, built new cabinets. So I've been into like uh, furniture making for for quite a while. So we fixed up the entire bathroom for about fifty bucks, I think. So so learning all these little things, and then recently I've started like building clocks mm-hmm. out of plywood. Um, uh, so uh, rereading the book recently to prepare for this interview, I read it way back when it got released. And then I read it again when I was going to ask you to be on the podcast, maybe like probably five years ago. And then I wimped out and didn't ask you. (laughs) So then I read it again in (laughs) anticipation for this. And it's, you have, you predict a lot of things and they seem to have been coming true in lots of different ways. So my two questions, I guess, for you is, is there anything that's changed that you wish you had written in the book is there has your thinking changed in in any ways that you think I actually should have changed that? And uh, also, just where do you think these ideas go in the future? And yeah, okay. so I mean, kind of goes back to that thing about like working in finance, becoming sort of more uh, neutral in attitude, or seeing more perspectives. Uh, definitely, when I wrote it, I only had one perspective, which was like my perspective. And it can it can get if if I wrote it today it would be less edgy it would be more understanding on, of of other perspectives it's not just like these guys are crazy but and, and but ideas the solution is more like well this is probably working for you since you're there but that's also I, I mean I think there was there's definitely been some growing up in that sense also from interacting with different people since then via this having started this uh, been part of this whole movement right. So, so, so a lot more cognizant of different perspectives and limits, and more understanding in terms of. Um, I mean, back then I was like, "Well, here's the book. You just read it, and then you change your life." Like, snap, snap, snap. <laughs> like now I realize it's a it's, it's a long process, and you know, it's more like it's it's not from here to here. It's more like sort of like a step. And sometimes people might be sitting on the same level for a long time and be fine with it, and then suddenly they have some, some kind of epiphany. But that is not necessarily an epiphany. Epiphany that takes takes goes all the way to sort of like where I consider the, the like the full eerie, uh, but it might just be a next step. So we've sort of like mapped out the uh, the pedagogical challenges of, of, of this stuff. In, in terms of the, the technical stuff, I mean, I don't know if this sounds like conceited or whatever, but. I'm I'm some, sometimes amazed at, at, at how smart that book was back then. <laughs> I don't know how I, if I can if I can like write it again like that. You know, you know since you go back and you read something, it's like, wow, this is really good. Like, <laughs> yeah. Uh, <I'm, laughs> uh, so it kind of sounds a little stupid because I kind of think I should be able to like write a better book now, but I'm sometimes I really doubt myself so that that I can do that. Uh, I think I mean. I mean, sort of like being more understanding of different perspectives also also kind of tends to clutter the mind, if that makes sense. Hmm. Instead of just presenting one perspective, it, I'm, I'm, I'm a lot, uh, I'm, there's a lot more, but what if, and what about this case, and what about that case, sort of like taking up my mind space these days. Yeah, and of course, I mean, I don't, I, I wouldn't say I have particularly more experience in, in sort of like the pure technical sense than I did then. I mean, uh, but I have talked to a lot more people since then. So I have their, I have their perspectives. And of course, since then, I mean, it's not uh, the, the, one, of, one of the huge problems back then was that there were not that many examples to draw on. So it all fell on me, right? Mm. And I kind of realized that I'm a somewhat unusual, weird person compared to sort of like the, <laughs> the, the, the if you pick some, someone at random, right? I mean, for example, we, we don't have children, right? So a lot of people will say, well, I mean, that's easy for him because he doesn't have children. Or that's easy for him because this or that. Because I'm, but I mean, that's sort of like a very, that's not the best way to learn to, to just try to copy someone and try to be like them. I mean, it's better to understand what why they're doing what they're doing than who they are, what they're doing, and try to do the exact same thing. No, exactly. Um, and that's why, that's why the book's so good. And I think maybe why it's so timeless and why it 
was just as yeah. enjoyable reading over the past few months as it was, you know, way back in the in the day in 20, 2011 or whenever it was, because yeah, it's yeah. more like I think you even mentioned it in the book, it's it's not a to do list or a guide or even a map. It's more a philosophy that you can right. then make better decisions to make your own map and figure out your own to do list based on that. I was, I was very deliberate in trying to make it as timeless as possible. Uh, or as non-timely as possible. This is also why there's there are two reasons why there's no sort of like deep investment. Or not deep is a very terrible word. Uh, it is actually quite deep in terms of investment insights, uh, but there's no details in there, right? So there's no ten step to like you just buy this fund and that fund and that fund, and then then you're good to go. Uh, because I, I knew from having, I mean, one of one of my quirky hobbies is to go into a thrift store and then like pick out like uh, old sort of like popular investment books from like the 90s and the 80s and the 70s if I can find them. Uh, something like from the 80s, how to get rich with uh, CDs, bank CDs. <laughs> yeah. And then you read that, you know, like with, with, you know, the future perspective on that. And then you just go like, wow, right. And I didn't want to have, I did not want to have written a book like that where you give, give someone some advice that then turns out to be terrible like 10 or 20 years later. Well, we're coming up to over an hour already, which is crazy. So I don't, I don't want to take up too much of your time because I said that I'd only, uh, this only take about an hour. But if people are interested in obviously lear- learning more about the book, I'll link to the book and everything in the show notes. But if people want to get in touch for any reason, is the forum, the ERE forum still probably the best way to post questions yeah, and get the answers the, yeah the forum is where the action is i mean as uh, at least some people have figured out the block has been on like auto rotation for like eight nine years now i don't really write anything but it's still presenting new stuff uh but i mean the forum is is, is yeah it's it's kind of like it's it's, it's 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 the grad school of financial independence if you want to put it that way it's not really a place where you go and uh, ask where how do i how do I set up a brokerage account or something like that? Well, no, this has been fantastic, Jacob. I like I said at the beginning, you've uh, you've impacted my life in more ways than I would have even imagined it would have impacted me when I read that article way back in the day. So yeah, thanks for taking the time to do this. Thanks for writing and yeah, writing the book. And uh, I usually ask all my guests this final question: just what's one piece of advice you'd give to somebody? Who wants to achieve financial independence? And it's yeah, it could be about anything. So I'd be interested to hear what you say. Well, I mean, but yeah, the long answer, right? Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm the worst person to ask that question. I would say just find someone who motivates you, and that's not necessarily me. I mean, it really has to be like you can only learn from someone who's slightly ahead of you, not someone who's far ahead of you. But once you don't, not no longer learning anything from a given teacher, then it's time to move on to the next teacher. So I think the best advice is to find the right teacher. And it's a good time for that. That's well, that's one big benefit of, I guess, this explosion in people writing and talking about buyers that yeah. you, you can find that yeah, next yeah, yeah. step, which is really good. Well, Thank you so much, Jacob. This has been an absolute uh, honor to speak to you after all these years. So thanks again for coming on the show. And yeah, yeah. hopefully I'll uh, meet up with you in real life one day and we can chat about more stuff. Once the pandemic is over. Absolutely. <laughs> we can move around again. Well, thanks again. I'll talk to you all soon. Right, cool. Take care. Finance.